All right, so welcome to community call number 34 for this Darknet community. Uh, today we have special guests from Hashstack who will be pre presenting on their interest rate uh, protocol. Um, we have quite a few um, team members from the Hashstack uh, team. So I think before we turn over to you for your demo, let's uh, go maybe a bit of intros. Maybe each of you can introduce yourselves, uh, your name, what you do at Hashstack, a bit about yourself. Aris, you want to go? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Leron, for uh, hosting us, and uh, it's great to see you again uh, after uh, <clears throat> the sessions in Tel Aviv. So, uh, my name is Aris. I'm uh, Devril at Hashtag. Uh, we have together uh, uh, Venkat. He's our uh, he's leading our Cairo development. So he's our lead blockchain dev. We have also Rajib uh, from the dev team. Uh, Zephyrin from the dev team and Mark, who is a uh, dev intern. Okay, great. So, welcome everybody. Um, so, without further ado, do, um, maybe it was Venkat, do you, were you going to give a bit of a deep dive into a, a demo of how, how your protocol works? Maybe if you want to share your screen and go straight into that demo. And then, and then after that, we'll, we'll ask a bit of questions. Uh, sure, Leren. Uh, can you see my screen? Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so, Hashtag is an under-collateralized uh, lending protocol. Uh, you will be able to borrow up to 3x the collateral that, that you provide. The <clears throat> main idea is to help you get better access to better capital efficiency on blockchain while keeping things fully transparent and you having control of your funds. Uh, so with hashtag, uh, uh, we are going to <clears throat> launch on the mainnet soon and uh, this is a good opportunity for us to talk about our product. Uh, so there is basically two things uh, that you can do. You can supply funds to the protocol or you can borrow from the protocol. And uh, so currently we support uh, these assets, USDC, USDT, BTC, ETH on uh, StockNet. And uh, it's pretty simple to supply assets. Uh, you just have to go through the whatever token you, have, you want to supply. So one of the unique things about us is we have a commitment period on how long uh, you want to deposit. Depending on the commitment period you choose, uh, currently, it's uh, flexible uh, one month and two weeks. Depending on the commitment period you choose, you can get a higher interest rate uh, to your deposits. So the longer you choose, uh, the long, the higher interest you get. This is a way for, from us to ensure uh, we have better capital management within the protocol. Uh, so, and for anyone who is who wants to borrow, for example, uh, let's say I want to borrow using my USD. Currently, I have a little bit of USD in my wallet. So let's say I want to put 50 USDC and uh, I want to borrow more USDC, and that is possible. Uh, I can take up to three times of this, uh, depending on the constraints or the availability of liquidity. Uh, so even borrowing, there is... Uh, different commitment periods that you can take. Flexible is when there is no lock-in, you can repay whenever you want or you can hold it as long as you want. One month is when you take a lock-in. So by taking one month, you get you have, you have end up paying a little bit less interest than the uh, flexible thing. Uh, so when you're sure you, there is a commitment you want to hold on to something, it is better you go for this so that you end up paying less interest. Uh, let's see if uh, this goes through. So once the wallet is connected, okay, I already have an existing loan, so that's where it's not allowing me to take, I'll show the loan directly itself. Uh, but there are some constraints like where we ensure uh, you cannot borrow again and again on the same markets, etc., uh, or beyond certain limits uh, as per our risk metrics. Uh, so 
once you supply your assets, uh, you can see your assets uh, that you have supplied and their details. The total supply you have done, even the API would be shown if, you, if there is enough time between the time you have supplied and now. Uh, once you supply, you can go for uh, uh, adding more collab more supply or withdraw certain supply uh, whenever you want, and you get to see all the fees etc that is applicable. And when you try to go to your your borrow screen, you can see the your current borrow positions and uh, basically if you see here i was able to supply a collateral of uh, 30 dollars and i was able to borrow 60 dollars worth here and i can use this borrowed amount into doing anything like uh, i can spend this loan so i'll go more in detail for how you can spend the loan so i think that's where the main part of the protocol is uh, so Aside that, uh, there are some basic functionalities like uh, any lending protocol would have. You can close your uh, loan anytime using self-liquidate, repay the loan itself, uh, and you can. And the big, the best part here is uh, you can withdraw the loan as well outside. So currently, if you see, though I have borrowed this amount, I don't get to get these funds in my wallet directly. Hashtag provides integrations on how you can use these funds. That is how we secure someone from running away with the funds. So though there is this $60, if you, let's say, swap this $60 using the uh, spend borrow feature that we have, uh, we are working with various integrations on StarkNet right now, and some of the things that work currently is uh, swap, Let's say just a second. Sorry, just a second. So while this loads, uh, whenever uh, let's say you borrowed USDC and you think you want to go long on BTC. So you would swap this USDC that you have borrowed to BTC. So maybe you can do this normally with yourself as well, where you, let's say you have $100 and you can just buy $100 worth of BTC. But if you are able to take $300 worth of loan and if you're able to buy $300 worth of BTC, you end up making higher profit if you are right. So that's where uh, hashtag comes in. Even you can borrow BTC and you can swap BTC to USDC or something. And that way you're able to short BTC as well as per your trading strategies. Eventually we want to provide uh, a lot more options uh, like staking uh, or adding funds to a liquidity pool so that you can earn those yields, etc. cetera. Uh, maybe even trade on a DEX. Uh, so that's where we are primarily focusing on even L2s as well. So uh, like StarkNet so that uh, we can build, we can work with other DEXs, et cetera, to ensure we can give good capital efficiency to our users. Avanka, I wanted to ask a question. At the beginning, you showed us the ability to um, to to borrow $150 while only depositing 50. So uh, that's an example of under collateralized lending, right? right. Um, quite an awesome product uh, actually. Um, like are we, as, as you're familiar on like Ethereum layer one, like compound, DAI, all those sort of platforms, you have to have over collateralized, typically 150 to 200% over collateralization. Um, what, what's the mechanism that enables you to do this under collateralized lending? Right, uh, so, <laughs> the major difference I would say is uh, we have understood what is the use case of the borrowers usually is. Most of the borrowers in our way uh, of compound, etc. A lot at present, a lot of them want to borrow to trade more. They might want to uh, take exposure to BTC or Ethereum, anyways. That they want to trade more. That is one of the major use cases. So when if trading is the motive. Uh, when we provide this 3x uh, loan, the funds stay within our protocol. Uh, you you are allowed to do uh, things like trading on using those funds. If you make a profit out of those things, the profit is yours. 
if you make a loss the loss is yours at the end the protocol recovers uh, the loan that it has given using the collateral so to quote in simple terms it is something like margin trading i would say that is one example of how a hashtag helps you get 3x collateral 3x loan uh does it make sense yeah so i understand so basically um what's happening here is uh the the, tr- the the funds are being used within the hashtag protocol and therefore if a liquidation is required you're liquidating within the protocol Correct, correct. Okay, uh, so, sorry to inter- <clears throat> sorry to interrupt you guys, but uh, can I add can I add uh, a, a crucial point in uh, in your question, uh, Liron? Please, please, please. Yeah. So uh, with the over collateralized uh, uh, lending solutions, like I have a compound, as we said in Maker, uh, you have the chance to uh, to get the loan. <clears throat> A smaller loan against your collateral and uh, withdraw it off chain. Okay, uh, the same thing can be done also with hashtag. So uh, there is an option for the user uh, to withdraw up to seventy percent of their collateral if they want off chain and use it for their personal okay capital needs, uh, and the rest uh, can be utilized as Venkan said uh, only as in platform trading capital. So. In that sense, you are already getting uh, what what the, the, the use case have been until now uh, with an uh, over-collateralized scenario. But with us, you remain with a lot more as uh, assets to be uh, used and utilized uh, within hashtag. Fantastic. Basically, what you're right. saying is that you have the the capabilities of compound and maker plus more. Yes, exactly. Venkat, please uh, continue. Sorry. Yeah. So like Ari said, this is the screen where you will be able to withdraw uh, the loan, a part of loan that you have taken. So since uh, my collateral is about $30 here, I can withdraw up to 70% of this collateral into my 70% uh, value of the collateral in the loan term directly into my wallet so in this case it would be some 20 dollars so and i can still use my remaining loan to trade as i want so like you said we are able to provide you more options than uh, what uh, Abe and compound is providing uh, and uh, earlier i was showing i guess the spend borrow section where you can swap your loan into some of the integrations that we support. Currently, it's uh, Jedi Swap and MySwap. Uh, you can convert into the token that you want, depending on the support of this uh, protocols. And if eventually ETH grows up, it's your profit. You can sell the ETH back to USDC, and you can close your loan. Just not doing transactions for now. It will take time. So, uh, yeah, besides that, uh, you can always add further more collateral to your loan to help to ensure you don't get liquidated. Uh, yeah, so this is broadly some of the major things you can do on this uh, protocol. Um, yeah, we can talk more about how we manage the risk, how we ensure uh, the interest rates are computed correctly. We, we use something called dynamic interest rate algorithm. Uh, we can talk more details about them soon, but I think uh, this is the overall protocol in, sh- in short. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, in terms of the demo, I think that that gives a lot of color to the people listening. Uh, we, can, we can move over to, to some pro- product questions uh, in the protocol. I think we can actually start, before we get into the interest rate stuff, uh, somebody's asking the chat about whether in the future we'll be able to, uh, there'll be an option to auto pay loans with um, gains from yields on deposits. Uh, can you repeat the last part again? Let's say you, you take out a loan and then you have a deposit that, that's earning yield. Can you automatically repay that loan with the yield um, without needing to manually go and claim the yield and repay it? 
Uh, that is a good thought. I think we can definitely work on doing something like that. Uh, we can, I think we could create some auto compounding or auto, uh, auto repaying loans kind of system where depending on the integration where you have staked and if you're earning good yield there, we can always use that yield to uh, repay the loan plus any interest that is due to hashtag. Yeah, yeah it is possible. Okay, so um, I think even before we get into the uh, interest rate um, algorithms, um, so you you started before showing if I deposit and I t- and I lock up the money for seven days or for thirty days, I'll obviously get higher interest rates um, depending on how much I lock the money for. Um, so maybe before we actually get into the deep calculations, like the the what's the the, the, the what, yeah how I guess how is that. Uh, do, let maybe let's go let's let's go into ha, um, how these interest rates are, are being calculated. So I don't know if you want to jump straight into the the, the algorithms you have or talk high level. Okay. Or I'll, I'll let you take it. Uh, I'll not go too technical in here, but I can give you an intuition of how this works. Uh, so depending on the uh, let's say if you want to supply and we are providing you three options flexible one month two weeks like this so uh, the long every each of this tranche is will pay you 20 percent higher interest so if the flexible currently is paying five percent uh, if you go for uh, uh, you know two weeks you will almost get six percent and if you go for one month, you will get 20% more than the 6%. So that's how we have designed. And this is a variable that is adjustable. And the overall interest rate algorithm uses on the intuition that we have borrowers and we have to pay them X percent of interest as a protocol. And uh, so the, sorry, the borrowers are paying us some X percent interest to the protocol. And we have our suppliers whom the protocol has to pay the interest. So we try to match the net uh, interest payables and uh, interest that we would receive. Uh, and that's how we put into a dynamic uh, logic into the protocol to ensure the interest rates are always subject to supply and demand in the market. Uh, yeah, that's how, in short, I would say so- this work. Maybe this uh, this specific example of um, you know, increasing the interest rate by twenty percent for if is that is that is that twenty percent something that's hard coded or it's it's dynamic depending on the supply and demand in the protocol. So as of now, uh, it is set. It is set by the protocol. Uh, it is how much interest rate we have to. It can increase. It set by the protocol. Uh, and it is it can be changed, uh, but it is not very dynamic. I would say for now. Uh, yeah. Gotcha. So, um, if if I recall correctly, this is your uh, dy- what's there's an there's an abbreviation for this protocol like dial, I think. Yes. Yes. Dynamic interest algorithm. Okay. But then in, in the, the, the long-term equilibrium, once let's say there's you know, millions of dollars of, of TVL, um then there's something more there's market forces will sort of just decide the the interest rate based on supply and demand correct correct yeah yeah i um, think that's what dial does as a prof right okay great um and the um so okay it's actually quite a few i think some listeners are probably wondering you know, why Why use this as opposed to other lending protocols out there? I, I have some good answers. I want to um, see what you, see what you say. So uh, f- firstly, um, I'll start with one answer. You, you've, show, you've shown the ability to do under collateralized lending if, as long as you're trading within Hashtag, which provides like basically this margin lending capability that doesn't really exist on other protocols. Um, anything else you want to add on that? Yeah, so there is something what we see like that is easily seen in front uh, to users. Like you were able to get better interest rates, maybe you were able to make better money by able to go under collateralized lending. That is something you can directly understand. Uh, but, and, but behind the hood as well, I think uh, 
our risk management is very we take risk management very critically since it's a undercollateralized lending protocol we always have to ensure uh, protocol the depositors or the suppliers never make a loss and it is on us and the community to ensure the risk that we set within the protocol is correct uh so we do several things uh, in that aspect one some of them include actively monitoring the protocol all the loans etc some and also include limits on how much someone can borrow someone we do not want to issue loans that more more loans than something we cannot liquidate or without we cannot liquidate without a loss so that is something we take very seriously um yeah i think uh, safety also is an important factor that everyone should see when using these protocols um yeah that's a good thing i think um risk management especially uh, in the um on chain world is very important um you also mentioned uh, the responsibility of the community in um you know contributing to risk management uh maybe do you want to do you want to um give a sentence about um different ways the community can help um I'm just being like maybe bug bounties maybe um other ways to contribute yes <laughs> can, can i elaborate Sorry. on that no. so uh so i guess uh we are we are launching a bug bounty which starts from march 1st so tomorrow and it will end on the 15th of march uh the details will be shared uh, tomorrow through our official hashtag accounts and um we are open and uh, we will be excited to see some uh, uh, developers joining in and uh, you know uh, take a look uh, at our smart contracts and uh, found find some uh, bugs and get rewarded on that and um, after the cairo 1.0 we will have uh, a dedicated cairo audit uh, also because until now we did one with certic but it was uh, around our evm smart contracts okay great so once again developers if they want to uh, look into that bug bounty program where's where's the best place to look uh, they can join our discord uh, uh, but also we will share it in uh, on our twitter also uh, with a link uh, uh, towards you know uh de details uh, and everything they will need regarding that okay great so and the, the links to the twitter and the discord will, will be in the um uh so yeah uh, our discord is uh hashtag dot community uh our twitter is uh zero at zero x hashtag uh, our website is hashtag dot finance so either way uh every way uh every each way of this uh, can work uh, and uh, uh, be sure that uh, they can be sure that uh, they will have uh, our full support uh, in anything they will need towards that good great and then and we also um send out those links after the call um so i guess Aris, that's also segues into my final question just in general with the roadmap so you're waiting for the co 1.0 um do you want to yes Okay. Yes, uh, we, we we are launching our mainnet on uh, March 15. Um, we are we are uh, doing uh, uh, we are gathering interest so uh, people can uh, can apply to uh, take part on our uh, mainnet <clears throat> so we can start uh, gaining traction. And uh, yes, uh, our next uh, big step is. The transitioning, uh, full transition on Cairo 1.0. Uh, Venkat is more appropriate to, to elaborate on that, of course. Uh, yeah, uh, we will be transitioning. I think uh, we're expecting uh, Cairo 1.0 and regenesis to happen in the next two, three months, I guess. Uh, so that is something we are actively looking forward to. Yeah. yeah, great. I think um, it's it's good for the community here that um, they don't need to wait for Cairo 1.0 in order to play with your protocol on in, on mainnet. That the your protocol will still be going live on mainnet already in the middle of March. 
um, and not, not waiting for regenesis. And I think that's a really exciting move. And it's it's one one of the first examples of DeFi with real money on mainnet, um, on StarkNet, which is really exciting. Um, all right, I think um, that's it from me with my questions. Um, do anybody from the hashtag team want to add anything that I didn't mention? Uh, I would like uh, to share. Uh, yes, but God, please, please. Go, go ahead, go ahead. So I would like to share some, uh, you know, key metrics, so uh, people who are listening can have a, a better clarity. So we measure twenty six point three thousand uh, Twitter followers. Our Discord is fifteen point four thousand members. Um, we are currently on six month on Starknet testnet. Uh, total users which engaged, uh, who engaged uh, in testnet are around 11.5k. We have uh, around 85,000 total uh, transactions. Um, uh, TVL as of now is uh, 72.3 million and dominant market is uh, Bitcoin. And uh, an interesting uh, key point that uh, it, it might be very intriguing to our uh, uh, people who are listening is that we also have a contribute to earn program. So we call it C2E. And uh, this uh, in a nutshell is that we are throwing tasks um, through Crew3 and uh, people can, you know, go and um, uh, do their tasks and claim uh, XP points, which later can be converted into uh, our native token. Uh, and this will be done later on after our uh, TG token generation event. It's very good. And if, and if people want to look at the Contribute to Earn program, they can just go to the website and follow the links, I assume. Yep. OK, great. So I think this wraps it up. I think, uh, yeah, those listening in will send out the links on all the social media channels. Um, and if you want to get in touch with the hashtag team, uh, follow their Twitter. You can also um, message us and we can connect with them. No problems. Great. I think we'll transition now to the second half of this call. Um, get uh, Ariel, um, one of the StarkNet product managers uh, working at StarkWare, to talk a bit, a bit about the StarkNet um, uh, roadmap, um, a bit high level, just no, no real, not real timelines, but much more about, uh, content. Um, okay, great. So we'll transition to Ariel. Ariel, greetings. Hey. Hi, Ariel. Hello, hello. Great. So hello. Ariel, I think everybody's talking about Cairo 1.0. Uh, let's not talk timeline, just maybe talk just general updates and comments about where things are at right now. Yeah, so uh, I think like we've uh, talked about two community calls ago or something like that. Uh, the next version of uh, StarkNet, O11, focuses on uh, introducing basically Cairo 1.0 to StarkNet. Um, this means that for the first time you'll be able to declare and deploy uh, contracts that were written in uh, Cairo 1. Um, this involves a bunch of, uh, let's call it, uh, infrastructure changes in StarNet. For example, uh, instead of sending uh, Cairo assembly, which was uh, what users sent so far, they would have compiled their contracts from Cairo 0 and sent this result. They are now sending uh, this new intermediate representation, uh, which is called Sierra, um, which we then compile to Cairo assembly. And this gives us uh, some very important uh, security properties. Um, yeah, and maybe I will also add that the planned version uh, for the compiler that will be uh, used throughout O11. And this is another uh, delicate uh, point, which is also new. Uh, each StartNet version has a fixed compiler version with it. This means that uh, if Cairo 1 added uh, more library functions, for example, more uh, libfuncs, this is the terminology in Sierra, then they are not necessarily immediately applicable in StarkNet. Uh, so 
we're going to fix a compiler version, and this will be the version used uh, throughout uh, the StarkNet version uh, up until the next upgrade, which may upgrade the compiler version as well. So some language upgrades will be seen immediately on StarkNet, and some won't, depending on whether or not uh, they touch some uh, low-level things. Um, yeah, and maybe the final thing, which is important for developers, is that the upcoming compiler version, which we plan to use, will include almost all the interesting uh, things uh, that were missing so far for uh, feature parity with Cairo Zero. Uh, in the current version, there are some important things missing, I think. A lot of the syscalls are missing, uh, calling other contracts is also missing, account functionality is, meet, uh, is missing, and uh, all of these are planned to be added to the compiler version that would be used throughout O11. So maybe there will, will be some minor things missing, uh, so we wouldn't call it feature parity as of day one, but it will be uh, feature parity adjacent. Uh, yeah. Um, so let, let's just break this up a bit. So um, you've got Cairo and Pernod, the language. You've got the compiler, which is separate to the language. And then you've got how that interacts with the StarkNet operating system. And it's not, um, maybe I'm just repeating stuff that's been said in early, earlier calls, but I think for the benefit of the community, it's still worthwhile. Um, all those three things are, can be developed separately and not, not necessarily uh, be upgraded in, uh, together. So you can in introduce new features to Cairo and Pinot without needing to update the compiler. You could also update yeah. the compiler. That part, uh, actually, Cairo 1 itself is completely coupled to the compiler because uh -huh. while you only have one compiler, the language is completely defined by it. So, uh, I don't know, CPP has many compilers. So, you have the language semantics and different compilers. But in this world where you only have this one Cairo 1 compiler, then it, it basically is the language, defining the language. But uh, upgrades to it won't immediately be acceptable. Uh, in StarkNet, or at least not necessarily. Okay, and then the, the and that, that's so the StarkNet operating system is bound to at least in the future the upcoming release is bound to a specific exactly. uh, compiler version. Exactly, and that is done to ensure stability. I assume um, that is done for for a lot of reasons, but eventually a compilation will be proven the whole reason to introduce Sierra in the first place. I don't want to go on a tangent here. You can, we, we can talk about it uh, a lot, but uh, uh, the whole reason for introducing uh, uh, Sierra is that we'll be sure that only safe Cairo assembly was put into StarkNet, one that cannot fail. So eventually this compilation from Sierra to Cairo assembly will be proven. And this means that one specific compiler will be uh, proven and you can't immediately decide uh, and it will lose a lot of the guarantees if you can decide uh, without consequence to change this compiler version because a lot uh, it, ca it carries a lot of weight the the code that will eventually be proven depends on this compiler so we should get used to the idea that the starknet version is bound uh, to, to this specific compiler version you get what you're saying, yes. So the StarkNet version will be bound to a specific compiler version. Um, somebody's asking in the in the YouTube chat, how easy will it be for projects to update with uh, update with these changes? So they 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 they've built some Cairo 1.0 code with a certain compiler version. The compiler gets upgraded. Will there be better compatibility, etc.? Or... Yes. Yeah, so if you're not, uh, let's say, if you don't give it any thought, then you won't get into scenarios where you think your code is StarkNet compatible and it won't be because by default, the compiler will only allow stuff that are accepted, uh, acceptable on StarkNet. If you specifically want to try out new functionality that was added in whatever recent commits to the compiler, uh, then by changing the compilation parameters, you could just say, okay, I know it's not supported in StarkNet, but I want to compile it and try it out locally anyway. Um, 
and, and this would work. Uh, I don't know if different toolings uh, will support it immediately. It will probably take time. Uh, tools, for example, like uh, like DevNet, uh, but uh, but you would be able to uh, to compile them. And in the future, with when some tooling start integrating, probably also test them um, independently of StarNet. Uh, but generally, if uh, you don't care about uh, very recent additions, then what you will compile is also what will be supported on StarNet. And may, maybe just repeating this, so th and that, like, Cairo compilers will be backwards compatible, or or there's no guarantee of that. Um, up to, I don't, I don't want to say only, but basically up to bugs. But uh, uh, yes, the the Cairo. Uh, this is a complicated question, and uh, I'm not sure, so uh, I will avoid it for now. <laughs> um, okay, this is this is helpful, I think. Um, and the, I guess the last question is, you you, you would still encourage projects to explore Cairo one point um, even while Starknet builds out support for for the language, right? Like definitely. I mean, with a version that will be released uh, in a week, uh, you will have almost everything you have in Cairo Zero. So today there are still uh, very let, let's say legitimate excuses. I mean, you can't call external contracts if your project involves uh, I don't know five different contracts. This is already a big problem for you. Uh, but now with all or almost all syscalls in place, there are a very small number of applications that uh, are missing on Cairo 1 functionality that exists on Cairo 0. So uh, on the next compiler release, I think that uh, uh, all the big stuff are in there, in there modulo some uh, very specific use cases. That is very exciting to hear. Um, and, that, and that will be with Google Starknet 0 0.11. Yes. Great. Um, anything else uh, you want to add? Um, I don't think so. Uh, try it out. There's yeah. a bunch of contracts on the compiler repo you can check out. The prototype for the account. Um, yeah. Think, Great, yeah, uh, I think it's like, much covers it. Those listening who are curious about like the need for Cario 1.0 and this intermediate representation through Sierra, we have previous community calls where that's discussed. Um, so yeah, please maybe we'll, we'll, we'll link that in the show notes to to, to know which, which community call to go to there. I'll um, be happy to also talk about it now in case people don't memorize every community uh, call as they should, as they definitely should. <laughs> You know what? Yeah, let's talk about it now. I think it's, it's an important topic, and I think it really underpins a lot of what, what's unique to StarkNet. Um, yeah. Fine. So, yeah, why, why do we need yeah why do we need CRO? Why do we need this intermediate representation? Yeah. So so far we have we have this problem of not being able to prove uh, reverted transactions. Uh, people who are familiar with, uh, with StarkNet familiar with StarkNet know that. Uh, StarNet blocks don't contain reverted transactions uh, at the moment, which is a very critical uh, feature. You would need to be able to include reverted transaction in blocks and charge fees up to the point of failure. And this is something we can't do now because if your contract hits an assert zero equals one instruction, I can't put it in a block, I can't prove it, I can't do nothing about it. Either I can prove something or I can't put it in a block at all. And uh, that obviously creates uh, uh, a denial of service risk uh, for in the future uh, decentralized network. Um, and this is something that needs to be solved. And the direction that we eventually chose is that users will not write immediately in the language that we are proving. They will not write immediately in Cairo uh, assembly and send this to us as there may be cases where, where we can prove it. Um, but they will send us some intermediate representation, which we will then uh, compile to Cairo assembly, which we know how to prove. Then the way we avoid 
this uh, reverted uh, transaction problem uh, is that in this compilation from the intermediate representation to higher assembly, uh, it is our goal and we try to guarantee that the generated Cairo assembly uh, cannot fail or more precisely, it can only gracefully fail. So there will not be a cert one, uh, one equals zero instructions, uh, but uh, imagine uh, if else instead of uh, assertions. This is the canonical example that I have in mind, which I think is useful. And with those graceful failures, we can then say, okay, this is a transaction that failed at this specific point. We can now put it in a block and even charge uh, fees up to the point of failure. Note that this is not part of 411. Uh, Sierra and Cairo 1 is, but uh, using these new properties that Sierra gives us uh, for uh, including reverting transaction will only happen uh, uh, in a future version. Uh, but uh, now the, the infrastructure for doing so is there. I just want to uh, emphasize something. Maybe I'm not understanding this. There's a difference between a reverted transaction that failed because like you reached in a set one equals zero and one that failed because you ran out of gas. Like on Ethereum, you might, your gas limit might not be sufficient enough. In the Cairo setting, both of those have issues, but like you could have a situation where you didn't pay sufficient fees for them to write enough code. Uh, I'd say that they're not different. They are both examples of reverted transactions for different reasons. But today we don't have this gas metering. <coughs> uh, this is a separate problem. Uh, today the fees are calculated uh, on L2, uh, sorry, off chain. And uh, uh, the only uh, check that happens in regards to fees uh, is that the fee that was charged in practice is not greater than the fees that, uh, that was uh, the max fee that was sent by the user. This is the only thing that is proven. Uh, but where does the, but no connection between the actual resources and the fee uh, goes into, into the proof. This is all done like uh, by the sequencer and, and let's uh, call it uh, off chain. And uh, this is another important thing that Sierra solves, the ability to do gas metering, the, ab the ability to update the consumed resources after every instruction. Uh, this is actually uh, another very important thing that Sierra gives us. It is not directly related to, uh, to this uh, reverted transaction issues, but, uh, but it also gives us gas metering, uh, which again, we're not going to use immediately in 011, but the infrastructure is there. This is a, yeah, we should pr probably be getting this message across more. So Sierra now enables gas metering. Yeah. Um, Fantastic. Um, okay, great. Yeah. So yeah. So we need the intermediary representations. I think I asked this on Sunday night. I'll ask it again um, for the benefit of the public. Other teams in this space, also like like the zk EVM teams, um, how are they dealing with these issues of reverted transactions? Yes. Yeah, so I think some of them. Uh, maybe simply did not uh, tackle this issue yet because once you're focusing uh, on the prover, uh, you're still not dealing with dose prevention. So, so in early stages, I don't think it's a concern, just like it wasn't a concern for us until we were happy about the current state of the prover and started thinking more about the status of the decentralized network. The issue came up, oh, what if users will send a bunch of failed transactions? We can't prove those, what are we gonna do? That's one. For some, uh, for some roll-ups, uh, they circumvent uh, or can circumvent the issues, this uh, issue because uh, the, they are not directly proving uh, instructions that the user are sending. They are sort of executing user code in a sandbox. Uh, and I think uh, Kakarot is a very good example for that uh, because Kakarot, which is a, uh, basically a started contract that knows how to execute uh, EVM opcodes, why doesn't it have a problem with failed EVM transactions? Because you have eventually this Cairo code, this single Cairo code, which is a sort of template, and it runs in a sandbox the EVM opcodes. And he can say, okay, if the EVM uh, fails, I'm going to do such and such. So as long as the uh, Kakarot code is fine, you don't have to worry about failed 
uh, EVM uh, instructions. For Kakarot, it's just uh, return zero instead of return one. But with Cairo, there is no sandbox. Users are writing Cairo assembly. We are trying to prove execution of Cairo assembly. So once you're uh, once you don't have this uh, nice wrapper around uh, around user code, uh, you're facing this problem. So certain rollups, I think uh, uh, ZK Sync, uh, I'm not sure who else, uh, uh, are executing transactions inside their uh, uh, their big circuit, which they're proving. So this can also be thought of uh, as a wrapper around. Uh, Around actual uh, around actual transactions, um, so sometimes you can circumvent uh, this issue. Uh, uh, this is also uh, each solution has uh, different uh, pros and cons. We chose to go down uh, that path uh, of having an intermediate presentation, which does not eventually change the contents of what we are proving. We are still proving the exact same thing. We are still keeping the same Cairo assembly. Uh, but we solved it uh, another way, basically. Great. Now this makes sense. I think um, if I'm playing back, what you're saying is like if you're running the code within the sandbox, um, you can basically check it before it reaches the, sequ the sequencer. Um, I don't know if I would put it that way. Uh, when I run a code in a sandbox, I, I decide what does it mean for the code to fail, uh, and I can just do some graceful failure in case the internal thing fails. But uh, if we're proving Cairo and users are sending Cairo, then if it fails, I can prove it. But if I take again the Kakarot example, you have their Cairo code, and assuming it's fine, they decide how to simulate EVM internally. And they can decide, okay, if the EVM fails, I return zero instead of returning one. I write if else and not assertions, uh, basically. Okay. This is a delicate issue. I, I, I hope I'm making uh, some sense. Um, no, I think you're making sense. I think it's a, it's a very subtle topic to explain. Um, and just this for context for the others, like uh, I, I always like telling the story that Cairo was first developed internally within Starkware when we were building Stark X backend, just for the benefit of like Right, generating these stark proofs without having to write polynomial on the whiteboard every single time you would want to do a new circuit. And now, um, and then so it was, it was very low level, um, no, no for loops, no while loops, using field elements instead of integers. Um, and then we realized, you know, this is probably worth externalizing and being the, the smart contract language for StarkNet. Um, and then with StarkNet, you encountered this issue of, you know, reverted transactions before in a, in, a, in a centralized world, you can check, as Ariel said, you can always check these things beforehand. Um, so I think the evolution of Cairo is, is really exciting to watch. Um, great. So um, we'll end there. Uh, thank you to Hashtag, uh, Venkat, Aris, all of the whole team for presenting. Um, I'll send out links um, after the call in the next few days. Um, I encourage everybody to, uh, to look into the bug bounty program there to also uh, play on mainnet uh, come March 15th, don't wait for um, the Regenesis. And to join the Discord, follow them on Twitter. Um, I think it's very exciting times for uh, the world of DeFi. Right, take care, everybody. Um, you, want to find, you want to say something, Venkat? I, I have a question, if there's time. Um, sorry, I, it's Feed the Fed. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, so... How, how fast do you think uh, we'll be able to consume messages from L1 to L2 either ways uh, in the approach post regenesis? How fast will we be able to consume L1 to L2 messages? Um, let's say you, you said after regenesis? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just I want to know more from a state. L1 to L1 to L1 to L2. Uh, Either is the, ways. Ah, okay. So L1 to L2 is the easy part, and it improves as the sequencer improves in performance because faster for the sequencer to include this L1 message as a transaction, it's just uh, catch it on L1, create a corresponding L2 transaction. 
So now when we're moving to Rust and the sequencer can process more transactions, same goes for uh, L1 to L2 messages. So I think there we have a natural, uh, I don't know, improvement vector and I don't think there's, a, uh, there's an issue there. Uh, the other direction, L2 to L1, uh, an L2 message reaches L1 only when the block is proven, uh, which uh, currently uh, is on main at uh, several hours. So there, uh, I can't really say anything about timeline. Um, I can throw some uh, prover uh, optimizations that we have in mind that will help with this. But uh, for example, uh, right now, all the proofs on, uh, on mainnet are uh, recursive. So... Sorry, I can't hear. Is it just... Okay. All right, you muted yourself. Sorry, can you hear me now? Now we yeah. can, yeah. Okay, this is weird. My uh, AirPods now stop working. One second. I think it's because I played with the box. Let's see now. Okay, that should. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, in the next sharp version, we plan to optimize like each recursive step and go from uh, 40 minutes to uh, closer to 10 minutes for those uh, for this step. Again, it's not trivial to say how uh, what's the actual reduction for the large proof that reaches L1, um, because uh, again, the the large proof consists of a lot of those uh, recursive steps. Um, so. So yeah, sorry for the vague answer, but we have some ideas, we're working on them, and uh, hopefully I will be able to give more concrete estimates uh, in the near future. Great, okay, okay, thank you. All right, well, we'll, we'll with that we'll conclude uh, this community call. Um, thank you for everybody for attending and to Castec for presenting. Thanks for having us, guys. Uh, looking forward to uh, uh, more uh, interesting um, spaces or conversations together as we both progress. And uh, we wish Starkware team all the best. Uh, and it was a great uh, talk. Take care.